Liberalism, Section. De Gobineau, Liberalism and the Genealogical Myths of the Community of the Free. From the outset, the self-proclamation of the community of the free felt the need to resort to genealogical myths that endowed this distinguishing gesture with a foundation. Montesquieu pointed to, quote, the forests inhabited by the Germans as the birthplace of a free representative government. The origin was not accidental. If slavery was at home among, quote, the peoples of the South, by contrast, quote, the peoples of the North have and will always have a spirit of independence and liberty that the peoples of the South do not. Indeed, the peoples of the North, end quote, who had demonstrated, quote, remarkable wisdom against the Roman power, they ultimately destroyed, were also distinguished by good sense, courage, generous sentiment, and the strength of spirit necessary to guide one's own conduct, end quote. The, quote, northern nations were referred to in England by Sidney and Hume, who celebrated as extremely free, quote, the government of the Germans and that of all the northern nations, end quote, which was established on the ruins of Rome and its military despotism. Again, for the mill of 1861, the French were excluded from the community of the free because they were, quote, essentially a southern people stamped by the double education of despotism and Catholicism, end quote. Burke instead preferred to glory in descent from our Gothic ancestors, as well as in belonging to the English, quote, chosen race of liberty, while Lieber worked Teutonic ancestors into the coat of arms of the United States and the Anglican race. At the end of the 19th century, the Teutonic genealogical myth met with great success. Notwithstanding the stabilization achieved with the Third Republic, the memory of the Paris Commune and of the interminable revolutionary cycle behind it influenced France's image. The scourge of brigandage in the South, and the geographical location, not properly Nordic, especially of its southern regions, affected the image of Italy. The Second Reich, by contrast, seemed to stand unproblematically alongside England and the United States in enjoying representative bodies, a liberal order, and economic development. These were the three countries now celebrated as the vanguard of the community of the free, or as the peoples who best embodied the cause of liberty. In England, as early as 1860, Lord Robert Cecil, future Marquis of Salisbury and Prime Minister, contrasted, quote, the people of a southern climate with those of Teutonic parentage, end quote. And in 1889, Joseph Chamberlain, the colonial secretary, officially called on the United States and Germany to form a Teutonic alliance with his country. This was a position shared across the Atlantic by Alfred T. Mahon, the great theorist of geopolitics, who likewise declared for the unity of the, quote, Teutonic family, of peoples belonging to the same Germanic stock, end quote. Mahan was on excellent terms with Theodore Roosevelt, who, going still further in his celebration of German and Teutonic peoples, hymned the, quote, warlike prowess of the stalwart sons of Odin, end quote. This ideological climate prompted a reinterpretation of the category of Anglo-Saxons, which now tended to include Germany, the starting point for the great adventure of the emigration of the descendants of liberty, praiseworthy for having rebelled against first Roman despotism and then papal despotism. End section.